Welcome to the video on chapter D1, Human Nutrition. Okay, so before we start talking about nutrition, we need to get an understanding of what a nutrient is. And a nutrient is pretty much anything that the body needs, okay? Um, there's two main categories, things that we use for energy, like let's say carbohydrates, okay, maybe lipids, okay, or it could be something that I need for a metabolic reaction. So let's say I need phosphorus for something or potassium, okay? Those would both be examples of nutrients. Now, essential nutrients are a little bit different, okay? These are nutrients that we can't make from the human body, okay? That we just can't manufacture from other materials, so we have to eat them, okay? A lot of things um, we can actually, uh, if we're missing something in our diet, we can take something that we already have and turn it into what we need. Essential nutrients, not so much. We can't manufacture, we have to eat them. Now, we're going to talk about four major types of nutrients, um, not so much for caloric or energy needs, but more for like metabolic reactions. And the first one here are uh, minerals. Minerals are inorganic, okay, so they're not carbon-based, um, and we sometimes call them elements. They could also be compounds. So we're talking about things like calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, okay, so inorganic um, elements or compounds. There's about 16 of them you need. It depends on which source you look at. Um, and we also need to remember that nutrition is kind of a fluid and dynamic um, field, right? So some people need certain things at some times. Let's say you're growing or you have a specific disease um, while others don't. So that's why this is um, not so much a firm number here for everybody. Let's say you're deficient, you don't have enough iron, okay, that could result in a disease called anemia. Um, anemia, um, being iron deficient, really not good for you, really kind of messes with our ability um, to carry oxygen in our red blood cells and manufacture hemoglobin. We see this typically in women um, a lot, partly because of uh, the shedding of that uterine lining every month, okay, but lots of important minerals there. Now, we generally only need minerals in a super small amount, okay? So I'm looking over here, like calcium, 800 milligrams. That's not even a gram. That's not even the same mass as a small paper clip, okay? And then when we get down to like iodine, okay, 150 micrograms, these are really small. And that's because they usually stay in the body for a long time. We use them to manufacture molecules or parts that are long-lived in the body, Okay, now one of the classes of minerals that you often hear about are these things called electrolytes. And it sounds really fancy, right? Electrolyte. Sounds like you have to buy some kind of special drink in order to get them. Well, that's entirely not true. Electrolytes are just minerals, okay, that are dissolved in a fluid. Okay, fluids include like your blood plasma, your cytoplasm, intracellular fluid, Okay, and they're present as charged ions. So we know that when we take things that are compounds that are bonded by an ionic bond and we dissolve them in water, okay, we're gonna get ions. Okay, well, these are electrolytes. It's not a big deal. You don't have to drink a fancy beverage to get them. Now, they're really important for some things like muscle contractions. We need calcium. Um, that's a higher level topic that some of you will get to. And everybody will um, join us in the fun of learning about action potentials and the importance of things in particular like sodium and potassium ions. Okay, And that class of dissolved minerals, again, is what we call an electrolyte. Okay, the next type of nutrient uh, we're going to talk about are vitamins, okay? And the main difference between minerals and vitamins is that these suckers are organic, okay? So they're carbon-based. Can we manufacture them in a lab? Yeah, we're awesome that way, okay? We can do that, but, okay, in general, the vitamins that we eat that are part of our natural diet are all made by living things, and uh, I'm not encouraging you to go out and eat a chicken nugget and hope that there are tons of vitamins in there, okay? Vitamins are manufactured mostly by our plant species, okay? You've heard of these things, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, okay, vitamin B, vitamin K, basically all the letters of the alphabet. 
And again, there's about 13 of them. That's not an exact number um, for the number that's essential, and that varies from person to person. So scurvy is a great example of one of those vitamin deficiency diseases, and that's when we're deficient in vitamin C. And vitamin C is essential for building one of the proteins called collagen. And collagen is really important for things like your gums. So without the necessary vitamin C, okay, we start to get all kinds of gnarly things happening to our body. Okay, again, not a good idea to have vitamin deficiencies. So just like minerals, okay, vitamins are only needed in uh, small quantities because the things that we use vitamins to make are generally long-lived, okay? Like the photoreceptor retinal cells in the back of your eyeball, okay? Those are made using vitamin A, but they're generally there a long time. So we don't need super large doses of vitamins. Okay, in terms of IB world, okay, there are a few vitamins you need to know. Vitamin A, which we just talked about um, with the eye a little bit. And if you remember, that goes back to our chapter on stem cells and Stargardt's disease, okay? And um, that's uh, one of the things that we use stem cells for is to replace the photoreceptor cells in someone with Stargardt's disease because they have a problem uh, metabolizing or absorbing that vitamin A. The other two that you need to know are vitamin C and D. So let's talk about vitamin C. If you want a lot of vitamin C, I know everybody tells you to eat oranges. Well, oranges aren't the only thing with vitamin C, okay? A lot of our brightly colored foods, those yellows and oranges and reds, so like peppers, lemons, papayas, mangoes, strawberries, super high in vitamin C, and also a bunch of green leafy vegetables, okay? Like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, okay, spinach, also very good sources of vitamin C. Again, we need collagen. Um, that's one of the major uh, byproducts of vitamin C metabolism, okay? Collagen is gonna be found in bones, cartilage muscles, okay, blood vessels. It's that outer stretchy um, thing on the surface of arteries. Plus, it helps your skin from wrinkling, okay? It's kind of an elastic fiber there. Um, now, most vertebrates can synthesize or make vitamin C from glucose using a series of enzymes. So it looks something like this. However, almost every primate, including humans, has a mutation for one of the genes for these enzymes. So we can't make it all the way to the end product, which is vitamin C. We just can't manufacture it, okay? So vitamin C is essential for humans and other primates, but not most other vertebrates. They can make it on their own. The other vitamin we should have some fairly sufficient knowledge of is vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential for calcium absorption in your cells. So you can eat all of the calcium that you want, drink all the milk you want, Without any vitamin D, we can't actually absorb that vitamin C into our bloodstream, okay? So if vitamin D is deficient, we're not going to be able to absorb calcium. And in children, this is particularly important because they can develop a disease called rickets. And in growing bones especially, if we don't have vitamin D, we can't absorb calcium. And then instead of normal bone growth, which... in uh, involves the calcification of cells, kind of like the hardening of these cells, we get these really weak cells, okay, with all these uncalcified spots. And that's going to cause them to not be able to grow as much, okay, so they're going to be sh uh, much shorter in stature. And these bones aren't as strong. So especially on weight-bearing bones like your legs, we often get this bowed shape Okay, just because um, those bones aren't calcifying correctly. And again, that's not a problem with calcium deficiency. That's a vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so you can eat all the calcium you want, but without vitamin C, we don't get any absorption. So how come we're not having to run around and worry about how much vitamin D we're eating? Well, because for the most part, okay, our skin cells are able to actually manufacture quite a bit of vitamin D, 
okay, using UV radiation, okay? So UV radiation from the sun triggers your skin cells to make vitamin D. Now, unfortunately, one of the other things that UV rays like to make is skin cancer, okay? So while it may seem wise to lay out in the sun and say, oh, I'm getting my vitamins, look how responsible I am, okay, you also have to think about the risk for skin cancer. And there's also a really interesting relationship between skin pigmentation. So people with a lighter skin color can manufacture vitamin D faster, okay, but they're also more at risk for skin cancer. People with a darker pigmentation, it takes them longer to develop or to manufacture vitamin D, so they'd have to stay in the sun for longer to make the same amount of vitamin D, but their risk of skin cancer is much lower. So kind of an interesting evolutionary relationship um, between skin pigmentation, uh, cancer susceptibility, and uh, vitamin D production. Okay, next we're gonna move into um, fatty acids. Okay, so remember, if you're asked to draw a fatty acid, it's pretty simple. There is a carboxyl group on one end, a methyl group on the other, and any number of these carbon groups with the hydrogens in the middle. So they're generally very long chains, Okay, this N number could be a very high number. I can take three of these suckers and attach them to a glycerol. So three fatty acids, one, two, three, attached to a glycerol would make a triglyceride, okay, or a lipid. So some examples that you may have heard of before, stearic acid, omega-3 fatty acids, okay, those are all examples of fatty acids. There are two essential fatty acids that we'll talk about. Um, and if you don't have enough of them, it can really hinder your ability to make certain enzymes. Now, it doesn't matter how hard you're working to squeeze into that homecoming dress or what your wrestling coach is telling you, you absolutely positively must include lipids as part of your diet, okay? Some pretty gnarly things can happen if you don't do that. So first of all, we know that we need fatty acids to make the phospholipids and the cholesterol that make up our cell membrane. So here are the phospholipids, okay, with their hydrophilic head and their hydrophobic tail. And here's the cholesterol, also part of the cell membrane in animal cells, okay? So without the lipids, that gets a little tough to manufacture. And we also use them to produce certain hormones. So hormones come in two varieties, peptide hormones, which are obviously made from amino acids, and steroid hormones, which are made from lipids. So without those, we're not able to manufacture things like testosterone and estrogen, and we start to get a whole litany of side effects. Now, this is not carte blanche, to go out and eat seven gallons of ice cream, okay? Although you need lipids as part of your diet, you also need to consider um, the overall amount of lipids that you're eating as well as the type, okay? It's much better to eat these unsaturated fatty acids, the ones with the double bond in the middle that are naturally bent, than the saturated fatty acids, okay? It has to do with our cholesterol levels, and a whole host of things. And of course, we don't wanna to eat too many. That could lead to weight gain, increased BMI, and then you're at risk for a whole host of other things. So while we need them, okay, just be careful on the overall amount and the type. Okay, so here's where the bad news comes in, okay? The two essential fatty acids that you need, omega-3 and omega-6, aren't part of butter or cheese or any of those other fun foods, okay? They're both polyunsaturated fats, okay? So that means that they have multiple double bonds, okay? And they're most likely gonna be coming from plant sources. Um, you can get them from fatty fish, like salmon, but for the most part, we're gonna be finding them in spinach, soybeans, nuts, vegetable-based oils, okay? These are the two that you absolutely must have. If you're wondering why they're called um, omega-3 and omega-6, that has to do with um, the numbered carbon where we first see the double bond. So here's one, 
two, three, four, five, six. This is omega six. And over here, it's one, two, three, and then the double bond. So that's how we get uh, those names. Okay, so another thing we're gonna use fatty acids for is to build cholesterol. Cholesterol is the nonpolar uh, fatty acid-based molecule hanging out here in the animal cell membrane, helping it to maintain that proper level of rigidity since it doesn't have a cell wall. In general, um, animals are able to take the fatty acids that are in their diet and build enough cholesterol. You don't have to go out looking for cholesterol, okay? Um, if you eat a lot of animal products, so we're talking cheeses, eggs, meat products, fried food, dairy products, okay? Um, those foods have added cholesterol. So your body's already making all the cholesterol that it needs from fatty acids, and then we're adding it, okay? Um, that could lead to increased levels of cholesterol in our bloodstream. So our cholesterol blood levels are partly determined by our genes and partly determined by our lifestyle and our food choices. So we really want to make sure that we're within a normal range there. And why? Well, because we really don't want a heart attack, okay? So if we have excess blood cholesterol, what that can do is it can start to build up in our arteries, okay? So whereas this lumen is usually open to the point where proper blood flow can pass through, um, cholesterol is part of the plaque that can build up here and make that lumen really small. If you get a complete blockage in one of your coronary arteries that services the heart, okay, that's when we can get a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Okay, so it's really not a very good situation to be in. We really want to make sure um, that we're limiting our blood cholesterol, making sure that it's within a normal range so we don't get this buildup. All right, and our last nutrient here um, are amino acids. So you're going to notice that carbohydrates aren't on here. Okay, carbohydrates are generally for energy, and we can take fatty acids and amino acids and put them through the same um, cellular process um, that's aerobic cellular respiration as carbohydrates. So we can use these for an energy source, which is why you don't see carbohydrates on here. Okay, so remember, amino acids, they look a little something like this. They have a central carbon. They have a carboxyl group. They have an amine group. That's why they're called amino acids. And then somewhere they have an R group, okay? So there are 20 total, nine of them are essential. This is really the one that you need to know the number of, okay? And of course, if we don't have the right amino acids, if we're deficient in some of them, we're going to have a hard time making proteins and enzymes, okay? Of course, enzymes are types of proteins, so you should know that. Okay, so there are 20 total amino acids. All of them are identical except for their R groups. Okay, so I'm just gonna circle a few of their R groups. They can obviously be very simple, very complex. Okay, so 20 of them. Nine are absolutely essential for everybody. You must eat these. Okay, you cannot in any way make those. There are some that are absolutely not essential, so that would be these, okay? You can make these, that's no problem. Conditionally non-essential, this is where nutrition is kind of a, a dynamic field, right? If you have a particular disease or if you're growing, okay, some of these can become essential, okay? So we call them conditionally non-essential, Nine are essential for everybody, and it works a little something like this. So let's say we're building a barrel to hold some water, and these are the amino acids that I need. If I have more than I need of one, that's great. What's not great is if I have less than I need of one of the others, okay? I can only um, build as many proteins as I have for the most limiting amino acid, okay, because then that water would come out.
metaphorically speaking, okay? So limiting amino acids kind of determining are determining my ability to make those proteins, okay? I can make the other 11, but nine of them I have to eat. Okay, now humans have no way of storing amino acids, none, zero, zilch. We have no amino acid savings account. So proteins have to be a part of our regular diet, okay? If you don't get enough of proteins, you can develop um, a protein or amino acid deficiency. So this is gonna cause a whole host of problems. I'm not gonna be able to make enzymes. Remember, enzymes are proteins. There are some hormones that are protein-based, okay, that I'm not gonna be able to make, as well as various cell structures. And then as just a human body on the whole, there's also a variety of symptoms. Um, so first of all, there's a muscle right down here at the end of your bladder. Um, it's a sphincter muscle. If Again, if you don't have the necessary proteins, you're not gonna be able to maintain that muscle and you're gonna have involuntary um, urine leakage called incontinence, okay? It can also result in the thinning of hair, um, bad fingernails, bad skin. And one of the things that we see um, a lot of times with children or people that are starving or they may have enough carbohydrates for energy intake but they don't have enough protein in their diet is we get this thing called muscle wasting where there's virtually no muscles on the bone. Again, proteins are a very important component of muscle tissue. Okay, so muscle wasting, and then we often see this characteristic big bloated belly. And without the proper education, you could very well think, well, those kids aren't starving. Look how fat they are. Okay, well, put your knowledge to the test here. Right in here, you're supposed to have abdominal muscles, and those muscles kind of keep all the contents of your abdomen, like your intestines, your liver, etc. okay, kind of tight and in place. Well, if you don't have proteins, there's no way to maintain those abdominal muscles. So they kind of let everything out and relax a little bit. And we also lack a lot of the enzymes that are necessary for fluid reabsorption. So this abdominal cavity is literally filling with fluids, accumulated fluids, like a giant a case of bloating. Okay, so some really severe consequences of amino acid deficiency um, on the long term. So unfortunately, in a lot of developing countries um, whose populations are growing very quickly and maybe outgrowing um, their ability to produce high quality food items, um, they often rely on what's called staple crops, like a single food source. So if you think about like Central America, I'm thinking corn, and in eight certain parts of Asia, rice, wheat, um, some of the tubers, okay, in Africa, like cassava, okay. Um, unfortunately, these crops are very low in protein. They're usually high in carbohydrates, so you're able to maintain enough, like, caloric um, needs, um, and they grow really fast, and they're really easy, but they're very protein deficient, and unfortunately, if you eat the same thing over and over and they're deficient in either proteins as a whole or just a couple of amino acids, okay, then the population as a whole becomes deficient in those amino acids as well. And so we start to see things like stunted growth, okay, lack of enzymes, um, all kinds of things um, plaguing those countries. So there's some researchers that are working on some genetically modified organisms. They understand that developing countries aren't going to start growing high quality um, protein rich foods. So they're taking the staple crops that they're already going or growing and inserting genes from other organisms to make the essential amino acids that these normally lack. Okay, so it's kind of one of those um, burgeoning fields where we can think about the opportunities for taking advancements in science and putting them into play um, for sociological reasons. So one of the more interesting um, diseases related to human nutrition is something that we call PKU or phenyl ketone urea. And you were tested for PKU just like every other baby. 
So pretty much as soon as the baby pops out, okay, they prick the baby's foot and they do a blood test. They always do this before the first breastfeeding. And the reason why um, is because breast milk contains something that PKU patients can't process. So how do you get PKU? Well, it's basically a luck of the draw here, okay? It's an autosomal recessive disease, meaning that you have to in inherit two copies of the gene, one from each parent. That means that both of your parents, at least, at the very least, have to be carriers, right? So including at least one of those recessive genes. That gives um, their potential offspring a one in four chance of um, inheriting two copies of that recessive gene and getting PKU. If you have PKU, this means that you have a gene that's defective and not allowing you to produce an enzyme which breaks down the amino acid phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is a really common amino acid, okay? And normally in our bodies, we have an enzyme to help break it down and turn it into another amino acid called tyrosine. Tyrosine, non-toxic, no big deal. Okay, if you have PKU, you lack that enzyme, you can't break down these phenylalanine amino acids, and the phenylalanine starts to build up in your blood. And one of the great things about blood, which makes this kind of a crappy situation, is that it goes everywhere. Okay, so this high buildup of phenylalanine amino acids um, start to build up in places where the blood goes. And one in particular is the brain. So it kind of gets stuck here in the brain tissue. And especially for developing children, they can develop um, mental retardation, seizures, severe behavior problems, uh, and even death. Since PKU is genetic, we can't cure it, right? But we can manage it. So people with PKU are just recommended not to have diets that have a lot of protein in it, okay? So they really have to stay away from the foods that uh, contain a lot of phenylalanine and then they can't process it. So their diet would consist of a low-protein diet, okay, with maybe a couple supplements for the other essential amino acids, we're going back to our conversation about the baby, okay, breast milk is high in protein, okay, and proteins are going to be high in phenylalanine. So we don't want a baby who's in a developing stage of its life to be breastfeeding if they're uh, a PKU patient, okay, because then they can develop a lot of um, very severe symptoms, okay, so we want to test them right away. Okay, so in the first half of this video, we kind of talked about what we should be eating. Okay, now let's talk about um, when we don't do what we should be doing, okay, or when things go wrong. And one of the things that we're going to reference um, several times is this section of our brain called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus kind of sits right here, um, proximal to our brain stem, okay? So it's part of that early evolution of human brain physiology. Okay, and it helps to control the appetite. So appetite control is incredibly complex. It involves a lot of feedback loops, both from the nervous system, from the digestive system, and from a variety of hormones. So a very complex situation our appetite is. Okay, so here's how this is supposed to work. Okay, when you eat, your stomach fills up with food. Now, your stomach is a muscle. It has the ability to expand and contract, okay? And when it expands because it's full of food, that physical expansion stimulates a nerve called the vagus nerve. So you have a nerve running from your stomach to your hypothalamus called the vagus nerve. It also does a bunch of other stuff that we're not going to get into, okay? The vagus nerve sends a message to the hypothalamus, okay, which then is supposed to tell the rest of your brain, hey guys, we're pretty hungry over here, the stomach's full, I think you should stop eating, okay? So let's think about this. Is this a positive or a negative feedback loop, okay? When I eat more food, 
Okay. I get um, an expanded stomach. Okay. And then the vagus nerve tells my brain to stop eating. So it depresses the appetite. Okay. Bringing things back to a central value is an example of a negative feedback loop. So obviously, if we have some kind of damage to the hypothalamus, like a brain damage or some kind of disorder there, um, this can highly disrupt the feedback loop, okay? And we may not be able to reach those sensations of being full or decreased appetite. The other thing involved with the hypothalamus and your appetite is a hormone called leptin, Okay, leptin's pretty cool. It's produced by your adipose tissue, your fat tissue. And leptin tells your hypothalamus to knock it off, it's okay, to quit being hungry. Leptin decreases your appetite. So it would seem to me, okay, the more fat tissue you have, the more leptin you're going to produce, which means you should have a decreased appetite. Okay, so... More fat, more leptin, less appetite, okay, should be a negative feedback loop, okay? But now, that's if we're talking about the amount of leptin and your appetite. If we're talking about the amount of fat and the amount of leptin, wow, that's a really bad drawing down there, then we'd be talking about a positive feedback loop, right? So more fat, more leptin. But overall, this is a negative feedback loop, okay? So because we're taking, okay, there we go, more fat tissue should, through leptin, decrease your appetite. And then if your appetite is decreased, you wouldn't be eating as much, so then you would have less fat tissue and less leptin. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay, now are there things that can override this? Yes, things like compulsive eating, okay, or things like uh, advertising can obviously override that leptin signal. So your brain may be getting the message from leptin that's like, hey, you should stop eating. We're not hungry. We have enough fat. We're good to go. But these other messages are saying, whoa, I really need that McFlurry, okay? So many things that come into play with our appetite here. Okay, so when we start talking about weight and appetite, it's a little bit of a sensitive subject, right? Well, body image is a matter of personal and cultural perception, okay? And so how we perceive our bodies is a very personal uh, thing. When we say things like overweight, and obese, these are scientific terms, okay? And they relate back to our BMI, the body mass index. BMI takes into account height and weight, okay? And it gives you a number, so you should remember that from chapter two, okay? Anything over a BMI of 25 is considered uh, overweight or obese, okay? And so while we may still culturally or personally um, celebrate or appreciate larger body types, okay, in terms of physiological health risks, okay, that um, really starts to cause some potential problems. One of those potential problems is hypertension. Okay, so hyper meaning above, okay, tension, We're talking about some kind of a physical force, okay, this is high blood pressure. So let's think about it. This guy here, has a whole bunch of blood okay, vessels to reach all of the cells of his body. This person here, let's say he gains weight, he's going to have more cells, which means he needs to get blood to more parts of his body. In order to be able to pump okay, to these far-reaching places to control or to, I, I should say, to pump this massive amount of blood volume we've got to pump it at a higher pressure. So if I've got to get blood to more parts of the body, it's going to have to be at a higher blood pressure. So being overweight is definitely a risk factor for hypertension, okay, and can put you um, in a very dangerous course for your blood pressure. The other thing that can be a significant problem 
uh, is diabetes. So there seems to be a positive correlation between BMI and the risk of type 2 diabetes. So um, not type 1 or juvenile diabetes, but the one that we call adult onset diabetes, type 2. Um, it's likely due to overeating and elevated blood glucose levels. So the hormone insulin, okay, allows your body cells to take in glucose from the blood. So if that's working a-okay, then our blood glucose levels are going to remain relatively constant because our cells are able to take all of this in. People with type 2 diabetes have what we call insulin resistance. The insulin is there, but their cells ain't listening anymore, and they're not letting that glucose in. So if the glucose isn't going into the cells, it's remaining in the bloodstream, and that's what we call type 2 diabetes. Again, probably an increased risk um, if you have an increased BMI, because your increased BMI is probably related to overeating, okay, and lack of exercise, which would burn off these glucose levels. Okay, so definitely a physiological link there. Okay, so we just talked about appetite control. Great. Let's talk about um, the three types of nutrition disorders, okay? So we can have one of these three, a deficiency, an imbalance, or excess, okay? Deficiencies are exactly uh, what they sound like. It's when we're lacking either one or more essential nutrients or we're lacking the number of calories that we need. Either one of those is an example of a deficiency. They're very different. Okay, we've already talked so much about what happens when you're um, lacking an essential nutrient. So let's talk about if you're lacking too many calories. Okay, this is an, uh, an example here of starvation. So your body would prefer to use blood glucose as its primary uh, energy source. Once you run out of blood glucose, your body is going to start burning off its glycogen stores. Remember, glycogen is a polysaccharide made of monomers of glucose. It's stored in your liver and your muscle cells. When those are all gone, when the glycogen's gone, it's going to start burning body fat. Okay? So that may sound really wonderful, but after we're done with burning all of the body fat, if we're still starving and not consuming enough calories, we're going to start breaking down skeletal muscle. Okay, so again, we talked about that. Um, this skeletal muscle can literally be digested. Okay, and um, yeah, just really not very good results considering um, all the things that that skeletal muscle kind of helps us maintain. So imbalances are probably one of the more um, common types of nutritional disorders that we see because they affect both developing and industrialized countries. And so um, this, again, means that we're lacking a certain nutrient. So uh, we kind of have the caloric needs met, okay, but we're lacking a certain nutrient or we have an excess of a certain type of nutrient. So again, that's exactly what an imbalance means. So we talked about what happens when you rely on a single crop like corn or rice. Um, they have um, deficiencies in amino acids and other things like that. So if you eat the same thing over and over again, you're not getting what you need. But what's interesting is the crazy rates of nutritional imbalances from developed countries that rely on a lot of fast foods. So there are people that rely on fast food for almost every meal. Fast food is typically deficient in certain vitamins, certain amino acids, okay, other nutrients. So if we're eating them routinely with not a lot of variety, okay, that can lead to a couple problems, either nutrient deficiencies, so like vitamin A deficiency, vitamin C deficiency, um, magnesium deficiency, or it can also result in weight gain, okay? So remember things like fast food, typically have many more calories than are needed um, in our regular diet. Okay, and so then we're getting to the last one here, which are our excess diseases. Okay, I'm sure all of you have used the excuse of, I don't want to eat my carrots because if I eat too many, I'm going to turn orange. Okay, that's a legit 
excess of beta carotenes, um, and that can happen. But we're going to focus um, our example on what happens if we consume too many calories or lipids. If you consume more calories than you burn, it doesn't matter how good those calories were or what a nice source they came from. It doesn't matter. When you consume too many calories, more calories than you need, you are going to gain weight, okay? When you gain weight, your BMI is going to increase. And then we already talked about some health risk factors with BMI, like hypertension, diabetes, a whole host of things, joint problems, okay? So I know you're enjoying your teenage years and getting to eat 19 pop charts for breakfast. Okay, keep in mind that at some point you won't be you won't be burning as many calories and when you're old like me, okay, eating this stuff on a routine basis can cause um some pretty significant health problems. Now, one of the things about nutrition that we really have to be careful of um are all of the claims. Every day when I open up the news, there is some kind of health claim relating to nutrition. And a lot of them are not founded in experimental science. They may look like they are. Okay, they may make advertisements, but they are not rooted in scientific understanding. So let's take vitamin C, for example. Um, I've seen this in products such as Cold Ease or Airborne, and it says it's a blast of vitamin C. Okay, so people take this to either prevent getting a cold or to ease the symptoms of a cold. They think that by taking up to 10,000 times the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C, that that will help them. Okay, and I can understand why they might think that because these commercials are really convincing. Okay, these packages are really clever. But hear me now. There is absolutely no scientific evidence to suggest that this works, okay? That any kind of perceived um, lessening of your symptoms is probably what we call psychosomatic, like your brain is just tricking you into think that you're feeling better. And here's some of the interesting science behind this. So vitamin C is water-soluble. There's no way to store the excess amount. So if you take... 10 times, or sorry, 10,000 times the recommended daily dosage, okay, your body may absorb, let's say, twice as much as it normally would, but that means that you're left with 9,900, I hope that I do this math right, and 998 times the recommended daily amount. You have no way of storing this. You're going to just pee it out, okay? It's going to be dissolved in the fluids that are going to pass through your kidneys Okay, and come out through your urine. Okay, you can actually test for vitamin C after you take things like this, and all of the vitamin C is going to be in your pee. The other problem with taking these long term is that your body may eventually get used to this high dosage. Um, and even though it's getting rid of it, if let's say you stop taking it and you go back to your normal, just recommended daily allowance, um, your body and your cells can have quite a bit of trouble um, readjusting and give you some pretty nasty symptoms. So in general, if you're eating a balanced diet full of colorful things, bright things, some protein, you don't need supplements like this, okay? They're not rooted in science, Okay, and you should really do some more research before you just start ingesting things and hoping that they work. Okay, so you've heard me kind of go on my little like uh, diatribe here about BMI. Should we be working to maintain a healthy weight? Yes, we should. Should we be obsessive about our cultural perception of weight? Okay, no, we should not. Okay. No one wants to be fat, we know that, but um, a constant um, obsession with our weight, our image, our eating can lead to an eating disorder called anorexia. And I just want to tell you that we often think of anorexia as being a female problem, but males are just as susceptible to anorexia as females. It's not just a female problem, okay? And people with anorexia may actually see themselves one way, even though they are physiologically very different, okay? So this is not the case of, oh, I had a cupcake today, I feel fat. 
This is a long-term, very severe um, mental health issue. And the starvation and excessive exercise that we associate with anorexia can again lead to deficiencies in nutrients and then a whole host of other symptoms, damage to organs, um, which are, again are surrounded by fat that you're going to burn, Okay, irregular heartbeat, your heart is a muscle, we got to take care of it, thinning hair, and death. Okay, So while we, again, should strive to maintain a healthy body mass index, Okay, we don't want to do that to the point where we're on the other end of the BMI scale because um, extremely low BMI can have just as bad of health consequences uh, as the high BMI. And that'll do it for chapter D1 on human nutrition.